Have you ever wondered why we go? Why do we go? Why do we go? We go to connect people to each other and to God. We go to fill hungry bellies and feed hungry souls. To bring smiles to faces and God's love to hurting hearts. We go to bandage bruised knees and scraped elbows and give hugs to broken people because people need to know that they are loved by God. And He has a plan and purpose for us all. We go for them and we go for us because we have all been broken and hungry and empty and lost and someone came to us. We are the instruments of God's love on earth the conduit by which he provides to his people. And that is why we go. That is why we go. That is why we go. Are you going? Support missions and change the world. It is a real pleasure this morning to have Joshua and Kendall Stewartson. They're part of our Archdale Church. We won't hold that against them. No, Tommy, I'm just kidding. Tommy Thompson, their pastor, is a dear friend and a, and a great guy. But uh, they are soon be leaving to go to the mission field to uh, Kunjip. Did I say that right? Uh, Papua New Guinea to uh, work in the hospital there. But uh, we're gonna, they're going to come and share with us. And at the conclusion of their uh, presentation, we will take a deputation offering for them. And so we're just happy to have them. So would you please give a nice new heart welcome to uh, Joshua Stewartson. And family. That moves your slide forward. It's a joy to be here with you. Um, such, such a warm church. You know, like when you walk in the doors, you can kind of feel the the, the pulse of a congregation and and. Such a welcoming spirit here. There's something really special about that. It's fun to, uh, after watching a couple services online, uh, to see the other side. Usually, I, I wasn't quite sure what was over there, so it's nice to, it's nice to get to see from here. Um, I'm going to share just a little bit about how God has been faithful to our family. Um, that's that's what we get to do as as a church body, right? We get to hear stories from each other about how God has been faithful in our life. And it's our privilege today to get to share that with you after hearing so many stories over the years um, that, have, that have been an encouragement to us. Uh, our boys are probably the better presenters than Kendall or I, so they both have put together their own presentations. So Asher, our 10-year-old, will share after a little bit about the country of Papua New Guinea. And Judah, our 11-year-old, will share about the actual hospital, Kuchip, Nice, nice pronunciation. We had to we had to practice that one ourselves. So, um, and then Kendall, uh, some of the will answer some of those kind of day to day questions of what life will look like as best we know. This is new to us, um, but uh, what life will look like there. Um, I want to start with a reading out of Exodus chapter thirty five. Uh, there there is this beauty to us being able to share these stories, and that isn't something that's new. That's something uh, that God has been, he's been faithful in preparing people and in increasing their faith since, since, since a very long time ago, uh, starting back with, with the Israelites. We get to see a lot of that. And uh, here in Exodus 35, we find the Israelites living out in the desert as nomads. They had been wandering. They'd been freed. It was this big banner event. God had saved them in this miraculous way. And now they're spending their time in the desert kind of wondering what's next. Uh, looking around, trying to follow God's directions, struggling with that, forming, forming as, this, as this people of God. But they've been given the green light to start building the tabernacle. And, and that's a pretty big, pretty big occasion. They're worshiping their God. They're free to do that for the first time. And now they get to construct this, this way to honor him and this way to, uh, to, to bring glory to him. But that would have to be a pretty big responsibility. Uh, Pastor Matt was telling me before just about how, how many challenges were faced building the sign out front. Uh, can, you, can you imagine building a tabernacle? You need to represent the majesty and glory of your delivering God. And also it needs to be a tent. This has to be portable. Uh, can you imagine going to an architect and saying, I want to build this amazing t temple and it also needs to be on wheels or we can pack it up and put it in a suitcase? Um, we're doing a lot of we're doing a lot of packing right now, and I, I, it's hard enough to pack a family. Never mind pack a, a tabernacle to to be portable across the desert. 
So this is, a, this is an overwhelming responsibility, but God, who called them to it, has prepared the right people uh, for, for this task. Uh, let's start here at verse 25 in, in Exodus 35. Every skilled woman spun with her hands and brought what she had spun, blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, and all the women who were willing and had the skill spun the goat hair. The leaders brought onk stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of artistic craft. And he has given both him and Ohiolib, son of Ahasamach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as engravers, designers, embroiderers in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen, and weavers, all of them skilled workers and designers. So Bezalel, Ohioleb, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. The person who jumps out to us in this story are these people with skills that God has given them, and in particular, Bezalel. And when I think of Bezalel, this is kind of imagining, the, the scripture doesn't tell us, but he had to learn those skills somewhere, right? So maybe while they were still in slavery, his father or his mother or maybe even the Egyptians taught him that. But up to this point, his skills hadn't been able to be put to God's use. It can't be very satisfying to use those skills to build whatever the Israelites were told to build in Egypt honoring these rulers that they didn't, didn't respect and these gods that they didn't worship. And so Bezalel didn't really get a great opportunity to use these gifts God had given him. And then they were freed, great news, but you can't imagine there was a lot of embroidery work to be done while you wandered in the desert, right? Like, so he had to be wondering to himself, why did God give me these skills? Why has he gifted me in this way? Why have I probably worked and prepared so hard for so long when I'm not actually getting to use um, what God gifted me with. And that kind of resounded with us. Kendall actually read this passage um, a few weeks ago, and we were talking it over while we were on a walk. And um, <clears throat> we've been in preparation for, for nine years. Uh, she started her master's degree, and then medical school, and then residency, which brought us out here to beautiful North Carolina, which we don't know why everyone doesn't live out here, but we won't tell anyone else that. We'll just keep it to ourselves. Um, nine years of, of preparing. And we honestly didn't know why. Um, I had enjoyed working. Uh, I liked my job. God called us very clearly for Kendall to start going to medical school, and it didn't make a lot of sense to us, honestly. Um, it, was a, it was a long road with a lot of us being like, should we keep doing this? Was this a mistake? And in just little ways, God would confirm it. People would, would pray and say, hey, um, <clears throat> we want to support you in this. We see God's hand in this. Um, Kendall would say, you know what, this is ridiculous. If I don't pass this test, we're calling it a wrap. And then God would just be ridiculously abundant and she'd get like 98% or something silly. Um, and so every time we kind of wondered, <clears throat> God would just help us take that next step of faith. And that's, that's how it was for the Israelites too, right? If God had said to them, hey, the Egyptians are going to be attacking you the minute after you escape, I don't think a lot of Israelites honestly would have left. They were, they were scared. But God gave them just that next little step to take. And as they took those steps, their faith, bit by bit, two steps forward, one step back, increased. And that's definitely been the way it was for us. If God had said to us, Kendall needs to become a doctor, and then I'm going to send you halfway around the world to this, this nation that you have to look up on a globe the first time you hear about it, we probably honestly would have, would have, it would have been hard for us to say yes to that. But God just had us take step after step along the way. And all along the way, we got to hear these stories from the church that, that, grew our faith and have people in the church that stood by us and, and prayed for us as we followed God's leading. Um, 
because they listened, the, the Israelites did, and because Bezalel listened, he got to use these skills finally in a way that brought glory to God. What cooler way than getting to build the tabernacle? You know, that had to be a dream. I'm sure it was a lot of work, but I'm sure it was a dream for him to get to do this and get to teach the Israelites and get to lead them in this, in this work. Um, and that's what each of us get to do. God prepares us in advance. He gives us skills. Sometimes it takes a lot of work to, to develop those skills. Um, but he prepares us <clears throat> for the good works that he knows he has planned. And that's what we get to do uh, now. I love this quote from the, the founder of World Medical Mission that says, mission hospitals are like magnets that bring people in with opportunities to hear the gospel. Uh, World Medical Mission is part of Samaritan's Purse, and they partner with our hospital, the Nazarene Hospital in Kuja, to help provide supplies, to help uh, send some doctors for short-term um, missions, and, and their, their founder, I think, just got it right, right on the nose here, where the gospel is brought forward by people coming in. It's a different, it's a different feel than, than sometimes uh, what we can do through church planting. Instead, we can minister to individual people who then take the gospel um, back into their own communities. And, and this is what we now get to do, is we get to, we get to use these gifts that God has spent years developing in Kendall, and there's countless ways I could tell you, but I won't, I won't take up all the time, of how he's prepared our family, um, how I've had years now to practice cooking, which will be important there because there isn't a lot of fast food. Um, just little things that he's prepared for us and got our family ready for um, over, these, over this past almost decade now um, that just are a testament. And so we're thrilled. We're thrilled to get to be here with you. Um, thank you, Pastor Matt, for, for the invitation. The, the North Carolina district has just been, you know, we only knew our little pocket of it up till now, and, and um, now getting to travel around each of the churches and see how God's working has been a, a joy to us, and getting to then be the ones who hopefully get to share these stories in years to come and come back and tell you how God's working and send back updates um, is such a privilege, because that's how our faith has grown all along, is by hearing these updates. And so um, as we continue to get to hear those, and as we now get to share them in, in a more direct way, um, with you, it's, it's just a joy to be part of this body, right? Let's, let's pray for a minute. Lord God, thank you for the work you do long before we have any inkling that you're going to do it. Uh, God, thank you for uh, the way that you work through our church, how um, you use us. We don't deserve to be used, um, but you have placed your stamp on us and, and prepared us for each, each uh, good work that brings your kingdom. God, I thank you for the work that you are doing here in Hillsboro. Oh, God, thank you for this community that you've brought together and the way that they're impacting the community around them. God, I just pray for um, your blessing to be upon this congregation, God as they serve you faithfully, as they serve with eagerness and joy. Um, God, thank you for the, the uh, blessing it's already been to our family to get to be part of this. Just briefly, God. Thank you that you go before us as you always have and that we can see your faithfulness just time and time again. Even when uh, we question it, we can look back on these times when you have been faithful to your people through thousands of years. In the name I pray, amen. Ash, you wanna come tell us about Papua New Guinea? Okay, we will be serving in the Asia Pacific region where the arrow should be pointing. In Papua New Guinea, or as we're gonna reference it, PNG. We will be in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. The island is New Guinea and half of it is part of Indonesia. New Guinea is the largest, the well, second largest island in the world after Greenland. It is about the size of California and it has about the same population as North Carolina. Papua New Guinea has three official languages, Tok Pidgin, Harimutu, and English. Tok Pidgin is the main language spoken where we will live. 
so me and my family are working on learning it. Here are a few words. Some of them are similar to English, but are spelled and said a little differently. Other words are totally different. Now I'm going to have Ava come up and say a few words in pigeon. Ava, do you know what machete is? Chop, chop. What about goat? Beanie. And tree. D-Y. Nice job. <laughs> Here's a short Bible verse in Pigeon. Can you guess what the verse is? God, e likeum, you me true. First John 4.16b. God is love. PNG is near the equator, so normally that would mean it is hot. But we will be a mile up in the highlands, so it stays a bit cooler. Because it is near the equator, the weather stays mostly the same all year round. The missionaries there told us that there is a wet season and a water season. Season. Each day is the same temperatures, and there's almost always a rainstorm in the afternoon. That's good, because our water will come from a rain barrel, so we want to stay full. Now I'm going to hand it over to my brother, Judah. Hello, I'm just going to share a bit about the uh, hospital where we'll work at. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, so Kujib is the town where the hospital and PNG is that we'll work at. Kujub is committed to healing, not only physical healing, but also spiritual healing. The cool thing, uh, Kujub is telling thousands of people about Jesus through health care. The cool thing about ministry through health care, like Dad said with the mission magnets, is that you're not coming to them, but they're coming to you, which provides a whole different relationship. There were over 53,000 patients seen in the hospital in 2020, and the hospital continues to help more and more people be healed in both mind, heart, and body. About 96% of the people in PNG call themselves Christians. However, many of the Christian people have tribal beliefs mixed in, such as beliefs in witch doctors, witches, and curses. For example, if you had a burn, you might go to the witch doctor and he or she would heal you. Sometimes the witch doctor has something that's actually helpful, but more likely than not, the doctor will actually cause more hurt than help. Um, in PNG, my mom will be working as an emergency medicine doctor, and not only will she treat pe people, she'll get to tell them about Jesus. One of the cool things about the Kujip Hospital is that missionary kids get to be in the hospital and minister to the patients, too. After people go to Kujip and have their lives change and come back as Christians, they often want to share what has happened. So what do they do? They start a church. We call those churches bush churches. Once a month, we'll get a hike 55 miles on average. <laughs> Not 50. That'd be a long walk. Um, <laughs> all other weeks, we'll go to the church on campus, which is service in pigeon, like Asher said, their language. Once every few months, there will be a special service for the missionaries in English, and, the, and other missionaries will travel from the churches and stations to join with us in worship. Now I'm going to hand it off to my mother. I did not know how cool it was going to be talking about missions on Memorial Day until Pastor Matt's just masterfully orchestrated you know, songs and slides and videos about it. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was just saying, this, missions is our response to Memorial Day. All the time when we're disciplining, especially our youngest, we ask, who is the boss? Ellie, who's the boss? You say it now. And she'll say, God is the boss. And we'll say, what happens when we try to be the boss? Bad things happen. And that's what our world is right now. We are all trying to be the boss. We're rebelling against God. And this is what we've created for ourselves, is sadness. Ukraine, Texas, all these things are because we're trying to be the boss. And we're taking away that privilege from God. And it's sad. But the church and God has an answer to that. And that's what missions is here and overseas, is we're bringing the news 
that the kingdom of God is here and it brings hope and it brings healing. And just the way that you kind of, you know, led us through that this morning through song and through scripture is just really showed me this is why we go. That video asked, why do we go? We go because God is hope and God is light. And he has equipped each of us to bring that wherever he's called us to bring that news. And it's just so neat. And sorry, Joshua, I'm going off script and he gets nervous when I go off script. (laughs) <laughs> but I felt like the Holy Spirit was just like, you get to talk about my good news on Memorial Day, and this is my answer to this. And I was like, yes, God, thank you. Just praise God that he has an answer to all this suffering and all this sadness, and he has an answer to Memorial Day, and we're just thankful that he has called our family to be part of that. So now back on script. I'm sorry. Uh, but you got to listen to the Holy Spirit, right? When he says something, you just got to listen. Um, so... We're going to go be, we're officially missionaries with NMI, um, but they don't send a lot of doctor missionaries, and I never, you know, we didn't go to Bible school, and we don't know how to, you know, do this medical missions thing, and so we're also partnering with Samaritan's Perth, because they send specifically medical missionaries, and so they have a large training, they have a large infrastructure to teach us how to do what God has called us to do, how to do it efficiently, and how to do it well. And then they also equip us um, and we'll cover like half of our expenses for two years. And then we'll go back to being like fully self, you know, fundraising and things like that. But it's just a blessing to get to learn how to go and be supported um, as we're taking this step of faith as a family. Um, Joshua, do you want to go to the next slide? Perfect. So as far as our roles and timelines, um, I'll be working in the missions hospital there. Judah did a good job talking about more. But um, as one of the doctors there, we see so many people because um, there's about six to seven doctors for 400,000 people. That's like if Charlotte had three doctors total. I just can't imagine. Um, people just don't have access to health care there. And so they'll come in the morning and they'll stay until they're seen. And so we just try to get through all of the people who need, you know, these are serious medical problems. It's not, you know, I want a doctor's note for work or things like that. It's, you know, serious medical problems. So we try to get through everything we can. There's a hospital there as well, so we'll admit patients and manage them. There's a lot of HIV, tuberculosis, malnutrition, um, things like that that we try to, you know, help intervene and to manage um, and try to destigmatize some of those things. Say God loves everybody, and it's, it's transformative, you know, to open your doors to everybody. It, it shares that, that good news. Um, and then we also do a lot of safe deliveries for people um because it's dangerous to have babies over there and so just so many babies are born we do a lot of c-sections there as well which has been um a big big ministry to the community as well joshua will be the field systems coordinator we don't know what that means (laughs) so he will uh I know, we're finding out. What, they, what this means is they know Joshua is a get-it-done guy because he is, that's, I married way up. And so they're like, if we just give him an undistributed job, he's going to do so many things, and he's going to do so many things. I know he'll um, just really bless uh, our family and the missions over there. And uh, the first two years, though, he'll also be homeschooling our two kindergartners because their missionary school doesn't start till first grade, which will be really neat for him to have that time with just the two girls as the boys go to school as well. Do you want to play, do you think, we're going to play this little video because it's just cool to get to see the actual place there and um, see more about what the ministry there is like. Since the 1960s, Kujip Nazarene Hospital has brought healing to the highlands of Papua New Guinea. That healing has been more than just physical, it's also been spiritual. Of the 14 districts in Papua New Guinea, seven of the districts that surrounds the hospital, we record 70% of the membership of the Church of the Nazarene. The holistic ministry is nothing new to ministry in the world as well as this part of the world. But being able to have the hospital and our medical team to be front runners to provide healing physically. And then we add the church ministry of extending opportunities for spiritual healing and a relationship with Christ is very significant. This drive to heal the whole person is unseen work at Kujip. While treating a physical problem, 
doctors often see something deeper. Most of the patients that we think of every day are our 60,000 outpatients or the patients that come to the emergency room, the moms who have babies or the people who need surgery. What we don't often hear about are the patients with HIV, with TB, with leprosy, with diseases that often make them socially outcast in some ways. And our hospital seeks to continue to, to minister to them. Most of the ladies, they will come with hypertension. That's uh, the disease we can call it, but when you really spend time, sit with uh, women, talking to them, you will see that they have got uh, problems in their marriage, problems with their spouse's uh, family, with their kids, with uh, that constant pressure. At the heart of this is relationships. Nurses and chaplains speak to the need for all of us to be restored and healed by Christ. Throughout the hospital, it was started by missionaries. The College of Nursing was started by missionaries. And throughout the past 50 years, we've continued to work on helping to train up the local Papua New Guineans to do the jobs that the missionaries may have started. The nursing program is a three year, uh, two months program for, to train the registered nurses. They not only graduate with the registered nurse certificate, but they lay ministry certificate as well. That we train the nurses to become the ministers of the gospel. This relationship is continued when patients return to their villages and share their experiences. I remember that night at the service, uh, the lady who was leading the songs, she was testifying and she said, you know, I wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for the ministry of the hospital. She had been operated on three times, twice by my father, when she had difficulty during childbirth and required a cesarean section. And she just testified to what the Lord had done in her life and how that had affected not just her, but her family and her church community. As far as our timeline, I graduate to residency June 30th, praise the Lord. And so we will be um, visiting family for a couple weeks. And then we have Samaritan's Purse training up in Boone, North Carolina, um, where they apparently pretend to kidnap us and do all sorts of fun, adventurous things to help us be ready for our new life. Um, through September, October, we'll be um, visiting churches and visiting family and things like that. And then I have to take a board exam in November to be certified, uh, and it has to be on U.S. soil. So we'll be taking that test, and then hopefully in November, Lord and Visa's willing, we will be able to go over to Papua New Guinea sometime in November, which is what our family is looking forward to as well. Um, we do have, uh, you know, email updates and a website because we love to share how God has been faithful. God, like, it, it's really cool. Our oldest Judah the other day was like, it is so cool how God has really been active in our family. And we just praise the Lord that he sees that and that we can share that with other people, you know, people at work who are like, why are you going? This doesn't even make sense. They don't pay you. You're a doctor, you know. And it's like, no, God has been faithful in our family, and we know he's going to continue to be faithful and we're excited to share the ways that he's faithful with you and with unbelievers. Um, just to encourage and build up the church and just brag on how God equips us and he sends us and he hears about the whole world. So if you want to be part of that um, and pray for us, and, and you know, this is us all going together because we're a body. And so um, just like God put on the hearts of people to um, contribute to the tabernacle and pray and and to be part of that, God also uses his whole church to treat the whole world and to show them his love. And so studentsnews.com is our um, website, but then we also have email updates. If you want those, the boys are handing out .org. .org. Good point. Yes. This is not your first rodeo. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but the boys are handing out papers. Uh, you can put your email address on there. If you don't have an email, that's okay. We'll send Pastor Matt some updates that he can share with the church if, if that's okay with you. I've just committed him to that. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of continue to share and to pray for the people of Papua New Guinea. Thank you, boys. Um, so to wrap up, it's just so cool how Joshua was sharing about how, what was the tabernacle? The tabernacle was God's way of dwelling with his people, of being with them throughout the desert. And that's what God has called us to do, is to bring his kingdom and to be with people in the darkness. And he sends us out as his hands and feet to be with people. And he sends his whole church, he calls his whole church here and around the world to share that love. And we're thankful that y'all have, you know, been so warm to us and shown your heart for missions. And we're excited to get to be part of that and share that with you.
I'm going to hand it back to you, Pastor Matt. We do want to help uh, with the Stewartsons with, um, uh, for those of you who, who may not know, and I think probably everybody here does, but I'll just be very careful, uh, be very uh, clear about it. Um, when you are an assigned missionary, there is um, a support that comes from the World Evangelism Fund that we give it, that we give to and that we pay. In fact, to this church, I think I am now correct in saying over 30 consecutive years of having paid their World Evangelism Fund in full. That's pretty astounding. That's pretty astounding. Um, but missionaries come back and they also raise money for their own deputation expenses and for their own uh, personal needs. Uh, and so we want to support the uh, Stewartsons today as, uh, as they are here in deputation. So here's what you can do. Um, if you have cash, we have envelopes outside. You can take the cash and put the cash in an envelope and just write on the, ca on the envelope, deputation. We'll take that cash and convert it to a church check and send it in. If you're going to write your own check today, as I brought my checkbook to do, make the check payable to the general treasurer. And that way we'll collect them all together, put the stewardson's name in the, in the memo line, and we'll collect all those checks together, and we'll send them all into the general treasurer for you, and I'll email you to let you know the result of that too as well. So um, we're going to do that, and uh, I'm going to give you um, a minute. Is there anybody want to ask the, these folks any questions? We have just a few minutes left. Does anybody want to ask any questions of this family? Because I'm, I'm really impressed. you got two preachers going there, man. I'm telling you. Um, you got to get them, got to get them into um, um, uh, seminary somewhere, some good Nazarene college seminary. Any questions you all want to ask? In, in times past, I still think in some locations, you, you, the kids do have to go. But thankfully, there's enough kids uh, on, on the station that there's a missionary school. Um, we just had a huge answer to prayer because for the last two years, it's been parents teaching it. Um, but there's just now, uh, literally this week, we got the email that there is a teacher who, not for this coming year, but for the next year, will be coming out um, to help teach the kids because it's kind of a one-room schoolhouse. Um, but the, there, there's something in the water or something because there's a lot of children and people keep, the, like most of the missionary families have four plus, like we, we're the small family. Um, so there's, I think, 15 or 16 kids will be in that one-room schoolhouse next year. Um, so some help with teaching. And if you happen to know any other teachers, we would take them. Uh, but yeah, they have a mission school there that the kids will get to go to, which we're very thankful for. Others? Uh, yes, we, there's a deputation um, um, envelope in Givelify. If you do that, we'll just transfer that money over, yes. Yeah. Yes, you can do it. For those of you watching at home, if you would like to support the Stewartsons, you can use the Givelify app. Again, it doesn't cost anything to download the app. Um, you can download that app, and then you can um, uh, use the deputation envelope that's there, and we'll know it's for this particular deputation. Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah, and they have a little, they, they've got an option. Uh, so if you go to like our missions page or uh, go straight to the, the, the give link that's on the card, they have two options, a one-time or a monthly ongoing. And um, like Pastor Matt said, the, the World Evangelism Fund um, supports missionaries, um, but not until you've been commissioned. So there's actually now, uh, just since we have so many missionaries in the church and um, uh, they've shifted the model, so for the first handful of years, you're fully self-funded, and then after you've been there for about five, six years, and uh, they they shift to then the World Evangelism Fund kicks in, and so yeah, we're really we're really thankful for um, the body support.